Hello and welcome to Star Diary, the podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. You can subscribe to the digital edition of the magazine by visiting iTunes, Google Play or Apple News, or to the print edition by visiting skyatnightmagazine.com. Greetings, listeners, and welcome to Star Diary, a weekly guide to the best things to see in the Northern Hemisphere's night sky. As we're based here in the UK, all times are in GMT. In this episode, we'll be covering the coming week from the 24th of February to the 2nd of March. I'm Features Editor Ezzy Pearson, and I'm joined this week by astronomy writer Katrin Rayner. Hello, Katrin. Hi, Ezzy. How are you? I'm good. I'm looking forward to see what we've got going on. It's been an exciting couple of weeks as that set to continue. It has. And yes, yes, there is quite a lot going on. So this week, we're going to try and spot Einstein on the moon. And we also have tiny planet Mercury. Keep your eyes on this planet. We also have a couple of planetary moon shadow transits to see. And as we enter a new month, March has plenty on offer. But more of that next week. Einstein on the moon. I'm intrigued. (laughs) Yes. Unfortunately, it's not the Einstein and there's no moustaches involved. But um, (laughs) that would be quite fun, wouldn't it? A moustache on the moon. Yes, on the 23rd, we have this interesting crater to try and spot on the moon on the morning of the 23rd. And you can read more about it in the Sky Guide in February's issue of the Sky at Night magazine. But just briefly, Ezzy, the crater Einstein, it's sometimes hidden from view due to lunar liberation. There was a bit of a tongue twister there, lunar liberation or the moon's (laughs) wobble. But on the morning of the 23rd, if you point your telescopes or large binoculars to the western limb of the moon... See if you can spot Einstein as it rolls into view. So, yeah, because it's where it is and it is affected by lunar liberation, it's not going to look like a circle, as you may expect to see on some, you know, areas of the moon. Yeah, because it's right on the limb. So you're sort of seeing at it on the corner of a sphere around like an angle. That's right. Yeah. So it's going to look quite elongated Mm. and it's going to be a good challenge, I think. So... You know, if you haven't looked at Einstein before, then I think for beginners, especially me, you're going to have to try and kind of familiarise yourself with where it is using a moon map or an app beforehand, just so you know precisely where to look. So, yeah, I think I will try and give this one a go because it's not a crater I've ever seen before. Yeah, because lunar libration, as a reminder, is where the gravitational tug of war between Earth and the moon means that occasionally... We usually see the same face of the moon the whole time, but sometimes it's slightly tilted to one direction, sometimes it's slightly tilted to the other. So we actually end up seeing about 59% of the moon's surface at various different times, which does mean that some craters, like this one, aren't always on show. So it's always good to take advantage of it when it does appear. Yes, I was going to say 54%, but you're right. It's 59. (laughs) Couldn't quite remember. So yeah, so it's going to be really interesting to, to try and spot this one. And yeah, on on the 25th then, the moon, you know, it's a waning crescent, it's only 3% lit, and it's also going to be at perihelion. So it's at its closest point to the sun, just under one astronomical unit away. And then three days later, we have a new moon. So, you know, it's going to be a, a welcome relief for dark sky observers, because as we all know, the moon is very bright when it's full and it gets in the way. So yes, it's a good opportunity for those of you with bigger telescopes and you want to get in some deep sky objects. Mm -hmm. It's always great when you can get to see those dark skies. It is, yeah. But like, you know, we have said in the past, I do enjoy looking at the moon though. It's they both have their advantages and their disadvantages. There's always something to see in the night sky. That's what we've discovered doing this podcast. That's it, yes. On the fence there. We don't love the moon. We don't hate the moon. (laughs) Just on the fence. (laughs) So 1st of March, the moon is just 4% lit and, you know, just a few days ago it was at apogee and today it's at perigee when it reaches its closest point to Earth. And today, the 1st, it's going to be around 356,000 kilometres away from us. So still out of touching distance. Yes, still a bit of a way to go. (laughs) Still pretty far. (laughs) And as the sun sets on the evening of the 1st, you may be able to spot a very thin crescent moon sinking in the west just following Mercury The pair will become visible around 6pm and they're going to set around an hour and a half after sunset. So, you know, you've plenty of time there to try and spot them. And Venus, we also have Venus joining the pair. 
So if you don't manage to see Mercury, the Moon and Venus will look spectacular in the evening sky. And if you miss this lovely sight on the first, then you can catch it again the following evening. So, you know, Venus is very easy to spot, isn't it? It's, it's very dazzling. I was actually just at some friends of mine the other week and we just stepped out onto the driveway and they said, as people are familiar with, like, you know what that planet is. Well, yeah. They at least knew it was a planet and not a bright star. Can you tell us which one it is? And it's like, if it's that bright, it's got to be Venus. Yes. Yeah, and it's always surprising how easy it is to spot, even, like, whilst the sun's not quite set because it is just so bright. That was the thing. The sun had set, it was quite dark, but it was really cloudy and you could still see Venus shining brightly. Yeah. It must have like just caught this gap through the clouds and it was so bright that it just pinged right there in the sky. So you get your expert astronomy knowledge, tell your <laughs> friends all about it. Exactly. <laughs> but it's good that Mercury's back. We For the past couple of weeks, we've been having to put in the caveat of, you can see all of the planets except Mercury. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's good that it's it's back in our night sky. Well, Mercury is very much in the spotlight over the next few weeks and other planets not. So it's Mercury's time to shine. So solar system wise, on the 24th of February, Mars ends retrograde motion, which sounds a bit kind of astrology and, you know, horoscope thing to say. <laughs> but it does have astronomical connections. It is a, an astronomy thing. So Mars reached opposition in the middle of January and since then appeared to have been moving westwards. However, from the 24th, the red planet will be back on track, returning to its eastward motion again. So yeah, retrograde motion is a phenomenon that is experienced by all of the outer planets. And it's just down to how Earth is moving around the sun. So sometimes it appears that we're overtaking a planet when we were once chasing the planet. So yeah, it's quite an interesting phenomenon to, to see. It basically means if you were tracking it night by night across the night sky, it appears to move in a different direction to what it usually does. That usually happens because we're passing it in its orbit. On the 24th, if you have a telescope and you fancy a challenge, Titan, the largest moon of Saturn, is transiting the planet as well as its shadow. But the transit will begin during the daytime with Titan transiting the planet at half past noon and ending at five to six, whilst its shadow transit occurs from quarter to two until quarter to eight in the evening. But bear in mind that Saturn's going to set at 10 to seven. So obviously you're not going to, to see the end of that shadow transit. And you're going to have to be quick to take advantage of Saturn because it's soon going to be impossible to see it in the next week or so due to its position being close to the sun. So yes, so whilst we've said we haven't seen Mercury for a while, we've had a lot of Saturn and it's it's going to be disappearing soon. Mm hmm on the 25th after sunset, which is just before 5.50pm, take a look to the western sky to see a conjunction of Mercury and Saturn. The planets will be separated by one and a half degrees. Mercury is going to be bright at a magnitude of minus 1.1 and Saturn at a magnitude of plus 1.1. That is pretty bright. You're definitely going to be able to see that even in, you know, fairly twilighty skies. Yeah, and you know, I have mentioned to you before, I've only ever managed to see Mercury once. So when I was putting the notes together, I was like pretty chuffed. I was like, there's some really good observing opportunities here that I'll get to see Mercury again. So yes. 5.50 in the evening, that is a very sociable time. It is, yeah. <laughs> it's not stupid o'clock in the morning. No. <laughs> it's just after work, at least for me, which is very cooperative of it. <laughs> you can pop outside with your dinner or a cup of tea and, and have a look. So yes, no excuses for anyone to not have a go at, at looking for Mercury. And also on the 25th, we have a shadow transit of one of Jupiter's moons this evening. So between 6.35pm and just after 9pm, we have Ganymede, the largest moon of Jupiter. It's going to cast its shadow on the gas giant. And then the moon Europa, it will transit the planet around 9pm until 11.35pm. So it's a double whammy of shadow moon transits tonight. Jupiter's already high in the southern sky by the time of the first shadow transit, so you can't miss Jupiter. And yeah, Mercury, again, we're going to be fed up speaking about Mercury over the next few weeks, I think. <laughs> Making up for lost time. <laughs> yes, yes, he is. So the 28th is the best time to see the tiny planet in February, which is just as well, because, you know, there's only another day or two of February left. So... You're going to try and look for Mercury from 30 minutes after sunset if you want to try and spot it. 
So on the 28th, the sun will set at 5.53pm and Mercury is going to be low in the western sky around 8 degrees above the western horizon. And you may also be able to spot an extremely thin sliver of the moon at the same time. It's only 1% lit, so you're going to have to look extremely hard. Yeah, that's not, not going to be the most obvious thing in the world. Not at all. Yeah, I can't use the moon to help you find your way to Mercury this time. Yes. If you can see Mercury, the moon will just be below and slightly to the right of it. But yeah, it's, it's going to be quite low in the, in the west anyway. But yeah, if you've got a, a clear horizon, then hopefully you can spot it. So on the 1st of March, I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the moon at the start of the episode, that as the sun sets on the evening of the 1st, you may be able to spot a very thin crescent moon sinking in the west behind Mercury. And for those observers in the eastern hemisphere, from their location, they're going to be able to see a lunar occultation of the moon and Mercury. But we're not going to sit here in the UK, unfortunately. But I think a conjunction is, is good enough for us to get out and enjoy it. You can actually see the two of them together. That's one of the things about occultation, is you can see it disappear, and that does look very cool, especially when it's such a newish moon where it just appears to blink out as it goes behind the moon. But then you're essentially looking at nothing <laughs> and waiting for something to appear again, whereas we can see the two together. Actually, I've never seen an occultation, I don't think, with the new moon. Mm -hmm. yeah, as you say, yeah, it's just going to disappear and then... You're not actually looking at anything. So, yeah, also we have a few planets at their best on the 1st. So keep an eye out for Venus. It's going to be unmistakable in the evening sky in the west near the crescent moon. Totally unmissable if you're outside looking for Mercury. So the 1st is the best time to see Venus this month. It's going to be shining brightly at around magnitude minus 4.2 and sets around three hours after the sun. Jupiter is also at its best on the 1st. It reaches an altitude of 58 degrees just before 7pm above the southern horizon. And we also have Uranus best viewed on the 1st of March as well at around 7.40pm in the southwest. And I love this next bit because when I was looking it up on the star charts, it just looks so cool. So <laughs> after midnight on the 1st, Mars is located in Gemini between the twins. And it really looked to me like Gemini had a lovely little heart in between the two of them. <laughs> yeah, it looked really lovely, actually. So... Hopefully in reality it'll, it'll look lovely too. So you'll find Mars 63 degrees above the horizon to see the planet at its best on the 1st of March. And unfortunately Saturn and Neptune are now not visible throughout the month of March but there's still plenty to keep us going. So yeah, it certainly sounds like there's a, a lot going on. The planets are definitely not going anywhere anytime soon. A lot of people have been paying a lot of attention to what's been going on with the planets, but we're trying to sort of keep things realistic and let you know exactly where they are and what they're going to be. But thank you very much for taking us through all of that, Katrin. And if our listeners at home would like to keep up to date with all of the latest goings on in the night sky, including the planets, then please subscribe to the podcast and we'll be back here next week with even more stargazing highlights. But to summarise this week again... We start the week on the 23rd of February with the Einstein crater visible on the moon. Moving on to the 24th, Mars is going to end its retrograde motion. Titan, the largest moon of Saturn, transits the planet as well as its shadow. On the 25th, the moon reaches perihelion, its closest point to the sun. There's a conjunction of Mercury and Saturn after sunset and a pair of shadow transits from Jupiter's moons Ganymede and Europa. On the 28th, it's a new moon, and the evening is also the best time in February to look for Mercury. On the 1st of March, the moon will be at perigee. Venus, the moon, and Mercury will be visible in the evening sky after sunset. And Jupiter is also at its best on the 1st, and you can have a look for Mars in Gemini. It'll look like a heart between the two twins. Unfortunately, Saturn and Neptune aren't going to be visible at March, but there's still lots to be getting on with, lots to see in this evening's night sky. So hopefully you'll get out there and be able to see lots of things. And we'll see you back here next week. From all of us here at Sky Night Magazine, goodbye. 
If you want to find out even more spectacular sights that will be gracing the night sky this month, be sure to pick up a copy of BBC Sky at Night magazine, where we have a 16-page pull-out sky guide with a full overview of everything worth looking up for throughout the whole month. Whether you like to look at the moon, the planets or the deep sky, whether you use binoculars, telescopes or neither, our sky guide has got you covered with detailed star charts to help you track your way across the night sky. From all of us here at BBC Sky at Night magazine, goodbye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Star Diary podcast from the makers of BBC Sky at Night magazine. For more of our podcasts, visit our website at skyatnightmagazine.com slash podcasts or head to Spotify, iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Thank you.